We work in varying environments underwater. You know, you can go one mile here and one mile there, and the two environments will be completely different. So to be able to develop different methodologies of how we survey, how we perform limited excavation, how we gather data, you have to take the time to develop a strategy of data gathering and surveying and such that is effective within that environment. But then again, being fluid enough to go to a different environment and perhaps put that strategy on hold and develop an entirely different one. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of exploration especially, is that the more sites you interact with, the more you have to account for. The more you have to be able to develop your ideas to make decisions on the fly, to be underwater, whether it's 120 feet underwater, 100 feet or 50 feet underwater, to make split-second decisions that maximize the data that's gathered, but also maximize its efficiency and safety for the artifacts and divers, of course. So that's, I'd say that's one of the biggest points. My name is David Hundreser. I am an underwater archaeologist. Uh, I originally come from the Midwest, Illinois, but I received my master's education over in Southampton, England. I did a lot of surveys of old wrecks in the English Channel there, and I've also worked underwater in the Bulgaria on the Black Sea on a couple projects there, and then terrestrially on the island of Crete in Greece. Every wreck site is different. Every wreck site is like a fingerprint. No two are alike. You have to come in with an open mind because there are some general concepts that you have to understand. You know, what are the fasteners, what are the types, ship types, so on and so forth. The first site we really worked on was what we called the ring site. And this was a scatter of upper decking, uh, rigging, mast rings, dead eye rings, so on and so forth. What fascinated me about this is the scattered nature of it. That it was actually a challenge to study this because many people get it in their mind that, uh, especially in the dive community, is that when you look at wrecks, so many of them are intact and they're easy to study. Even in the English Channel, you have World War II shipwrecks that are easier to study because they're intact. It really becomes a challenge when you have a wreck site, but it's debris and you need to study debris. And it's more of a jigsaw puzzle then, where you have pieces scattered all over, you don't know what it's supposed to make up, you don't know what it looks like, but using skill and time and archival research and comparative analysis, study of composition, of shape, of type, it all begins to add to the greater understanding and you slowly piece it together. In regards to the ring site, this is probably mid 1800s or so late. When you look at something like a mast ring. Mast rings were used to secure the masts on ships. So we'll take that single artifact. When you look at a mast ring, you can look at it and the first thing you look at is the size of it. What are the dimensions of it? Mm -hmm. And if it's a large mass ring, then you can start to perhaps put together the hypothesis that it was a larger ship because larger ships needed larger mass bands. So that's the first thing you look at. Then you look at the composition. Is it 100% iron? Is it an alloy? And if it is, when did those start to be used in history? You know, when did we really start to mix alloys? Or if it's 100% iron, then perhaps that gives you an earlier, earlier date range. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, is the fact that it is iron. It's not rope. Uh, whereas in early shipwright, it was usually rope that they used for fasteners and securing things down because although they did have metallurgy, it was incredibly expensive to use and to produce because it was handmade. They might have used molds, but it took an immense amount of time. So it's either, you know, perhaps a very, very advanced early shipwright shipwreck with somebody who had a ton of money to create something incredibly unique or it was a later shipwreck that coincides with what you see in terms of that, um, that uh, timeline.
Then you can also look at what the fasteners were used on the mast ring itself. Were they handmade bolts or were they bolts with square heads or screws and so on and so forth. And then you can start to look at what was traditionally used. You can look at the, uh, the shipwright tools in the medieval period, even back in England. These are very well preserved. So you can start to look at what's the shape, what did they use, what were the tools, what were the fasteners like and you can compare that to what we already know and then develop a timeline along the basis of that. One of the coolest artifacts I found was a long keel pin. Mm. What, it, what I learned from it that excited me most and that uh, over the course of working here I had made contacts in, in different parts of the country with you know traditional um, ships like in Yorktown, Virginia or the USS Constitution Museum and like I said when you're dealing with the debris it, you have to look at these pins whereas if you look at the shipwreck itself I remember in England going to the the Mary Rose Museum or the HMS Victory and you get to see the ship or in regards to the Mary Rose a portion of the ship but you don't really get an up close and personal interaction with what makes up that ship, mm -hmm. uh, what really puts it together. And so we find this long pin and I had never seen one that long before. And so then I started researching, I started reaching out to contacts and slowly it began to develop this narrative really from nothing, just the exploration and discovery of this pin to okay well given the length not only is this probably a keel pin but this also tells you where on the ship it was from on either the bow or the stern in the dead wood where you have you know wood pieces of logs and trees that are incredibly thick because mm. this was also from a time where trees that were being harvested were much larger than anything we see today because they've all been cut down for construction and shipwright so just how that narrative developed around this pin you know that you find something Thing and you use it as a reference. You explore it, you discover, and you slowly start to piece together this narrative that helps you really tell yourself and others what exists here, what is it, and more importantly, what does it mean in the larger context of shipwrecks, the shipwreck we have, as well as shipwreck archaeology in general. When you look at our team, it is an incredibly diverse array of people that come from many different backgrounds. It really comes down to our mutual passion of the subject of archaeology and wanting to learn. I'd say absolutely that's one of the biggest points. Everybody on the team wants to learn and are willing to learn and are willing to try new things. That is the most important part of this team. We don't know what is out there, but what could be out there. That's the essence of exploration and true archaeology. 